You ever gotten a new job that's kind of like completely new to you, to the point you don't even really know what to expect? Or maybe you like lied your way into getting a job because you figured you could do it, but you're, on paper, not qualified in the least for it, or even have any experience in that line of work? Or have you started a new job and it's really not what you expected at all, and you feel the slow, dawning realization that you might be just a teensy bit in over your head? Nah, I ain't never felt like that either. Greetings, good humans, and welcome to Tabletop Alchemy, where sometimes it's just story time. And we catapult much gratitude over the digital divide to our patrons for their awesome support. Thank you very much. All right, well, I've been known to talk a lot, and I've been known to talk a lot about myself. Welcome to YouTube, the narcissist platform. So I thought I'd tell you the story of how I actually got into the Hollywood special effects industry, because I think it's kind of funny and kind of unexpected, and I personally kind of like origin stories, because I'm always curious about how someone got to where they are way more than where they are when they're at the top of their game. And no, I'm not implying that I'm at the top of any game, let alone my own. Some of you expressed interest in some war stories, so I thought this was a decent one to tell. I've told this story before on my short-lived podcast, but there's definitely a lot more of you in the audience today, so I figured I'd archive this one on the old YouTube for posterity. Okay, so the year is 1995, or 96. The end of one, beginning of the other, somewhere in there. As I've mentioned before, I was working at Starbucks, assistant manager in Starbucks, in fact. One of the highest positions I've ever held, to be perfectly honest. And I had started working weekends at my friend's hobby store in Torrance, California, Fryler's Historical Models. It was a fairly well-known hobby shop in Southern California, and I'd met the owner's son when they had opened a second store in Palm Desert, California, where I lived. That branch didn't stay open too long, but I met a bunch of guys I ended up gaming with and eventually working with in the effects industry later on. Because one day we're just hanging at the shop in Torrance, doing gamer stuff, I was probably looking at the game's workshop catalog and adding up how much my employee discount would take off of this brand new game called Necromunda, and this fax comes in on the fax machine. A fax machine is an ancient device that was installed in every commercial business and works like a photocopier connected by telephone lines to every other fax machine in the telephone network. Telephone lines were these wires that ran through the ground. Okay, okay, I'll stop. But yeah, the hobby shop got a fax that literally said, well, I'll paraphrase here. It said, hey, do you like to build models? Do you like movies? How would you like to build models for movies? Yep, a fax came in with a hiring notice from a special effects shop in Culver City. What's weirder is that most of us didn't even think about it very much. But one of my best friends who didn't work at the hobby shop but was and is a fantastic model maker. The hobby shop owner told him about it and he called the number and went in for an interview. I'm pretty sure he got hired on the spot and he had to move up to Los Angeles from the desert where we all grew up. And yep, he started working for a company called Vision Crew Unlimited. And his first job was working on deck details for the 40 foot long museum grade 120th scale Titanic model for Cameron's Titanic. So a few weeks go by, maybe a month, I don't really remember, but my buddy says, hey man, you need to come work here. So I got an interview set up and I remember asking like, what should I bring to the interview? I was told to just bring some of the models I'd worked on at home. I remember taking a selection of really not great miniatures. I think I had a full Dwarven Blood Bowl team and I took an eighth scale resin garage kit of Dune and Newt from Appleseed and that was about it. I really hadn't built a lot of kits. I just painted figures for games. Not even terrain, I didn't have a lick of terrain at the time. So I drive up to Culver City to this effects shop, which is inside a building that was originally like an auto body shop or something like that. And I go up to the office with my little cardboard box of gaming and anime figures and I sit down with who I later find out is the CEO of Vision Crew, Evan Jacobs. He's currently a creative finishing supervisor for digital effects on a ton of Marvel flicks. I show him my minis and he's just kind of like, yeah, okay, this guy can hold an X-Acto knife. Can you start Monday? This was a Friday, you know, and I still had two jobs. So I said, you know, sure, I can do that. Oh, and uh, what's the pay rate? 15 bucks an hour, 10 hour days minimum, so always 10 hours of overtime. I think I was only making like eight or nine bucks an hour at Starbucks, so this was a pretty significant income jump. So I had to actually go quit my jobs. It's the only time I didn't give my current employer a two week notice, except that time I got fired from the pizza place. I walked into my Starbucks on a busy Friday afternoon and told the head manager that I had to quit. The manager, who I liked, he was a cool guy, he was like, oh, that really sucks, man, like, when's your last day? And I said, uh, well, yesterday was my last day. And he sort of freaked out, I, I don't blame him. I, I told him I got a job making stuff for the movies and I had to start Monday. And he just sort of ran to the back room. And so, you know, I went, uh, I went shopping. <laughs> My buddy helped me out with a list of tools I needed to buy over the weekend. 
So I went to Sears and purchased a toolbox and a screw gun and a bunch of other like normal sized tools I'd never owned in my life, like wrenches and full size pliers and stuff like that. I mean, all I had was stuff for miniatures, you know, cause I built and painted miniatures. So now I've got this, what to me is a huge craftsman toolbox and it's full of stuff and it's heavy. And I just, I just don't really know what I've got myself into yet. All right, pardon the interruption. I got to cut in here from the editing suite. This glorious space you see here. Anyway, I realized I forgot to clarify one particular fact that's kind of important, and that is why were all of these special effects shops hiring? Like literally people from hobby stores and, you know, basically anyone who could hold an exacto knife. And the reason is that there were three movies being produced, three very large budget feature films that all happened to be going into production at the same time. The Fifth Element, Titanic, and Dante's Peak. All the shops had literally already hired all of the existing, like, special effects personnel, basically. And they just needed more bodies. There just needed to be more craftsmen working on these projects. But yeah, because those three very large budget practical effects intensive films were all being produced at the same time, right before the, really the onslaught of CG animation proved to be a benefit to a lot of us that weren't employed in that industry. That's how we got in, because they just needed people at that time. All right, but back to your regularly scheduled uh, the regular video that's going on over, I don't know what I'm saying. Get out of here. So Monday rolls around and I gotta leave my place at like six in the morning to get to work by seven in LA traffic. And my buddy Hoffman helps me set up my toolbox at what's gonna be my desk, which is basically a four by eight table built out of two by fours. And it's got like a shelf thing built along the back. And on the other side, is his desk. He's got all kinds of stuff piled on his desk. It's all this deck detail for the top of the Titanic, like little cranes and those weird funnel things you see sticking up out of the decks of boats. There's little brass ladders and resin molding stuff, and it's all pretty cool, if like a little overwhelming at the amount of stuff he's got on his desk. I get a quick tour of the facility and I see this massive thing in one of the main open build areas. It's 10 feet long and it's got a frame welded out of two inch box steel. It's shaped kind of like a giant ice cream sandwich. After the little tour, Evan tells me my first job is to build the front end of the Earth warship for the fifth element. And I was like, okay. And he points out that steel frame ice cream sandwich thing, that's the warship. The front end is like almost four feet across and a foot tall. I was completely taken aback. I couldn't wrap my head around the idea that a miniature spaceship was as big as my car and welded up out of two inch steel. And then Evan shows me a rack of raw materials. It's full of four by eight sheets of plywood, MDF, Sintra, plexiglass, different thicknesses, just like big industrial sheets. And he says, yeah, you can cut like a base for the front end out of this six millimeter Sintra stuff. And he asked me if I've ever worked with Sintra before. And I was like, no, I don't, and I've never even heard of this. And he says, well, you can just rough cut the base out on the table saw and then use the bandsaw over there to shape it, etc." And I was like, Okay, um, what's a table saw? <laughs> he, he points to this thing that's right next to the racks of sheet material, and it's what I know now is a table saw, and the table part of the table saw is another four by eight sheet piece of melamine with a giant saw blade sticking up out of the middle of it. And he's like, you've never used a table saw before? No, sir. Okay, so he gives me a tutorial on it stressing, you know, safety and stuff and explaining to me that if I fuck up pushing material through the blade, it can kick back. And I think he demonstrated with a piece of foam core that like goes flying backward when he sort of jukes it into the blade. So don't do that, he says. And, and yes, during my couple of years there, I did get kicked in the stomach with a chunk of wood that the saw didn't like. So there's a lot of fairly dangerous stuff in a shop like that. But you know, this was sort of like a, hey, welcome to the real world sort of place. At this point, I was truly standing there thinking, I've made a grave error in judgment. I should go back to serving lattes and cappuccinos. I mean, I'm thinking this whole time, like how cool, I'm gonna build models at a desk, just like at home, but they're gonna be filmed for the movies. But I'm standing in an industrial workshop where people are welding stuff. Everyone's wearing safety goggles and respirators. There's compressed air tools whining in the background, grinders and sanders and drill presses and massive saws and toolboxes that are as big as anything I've seen in a car mechanic shop. And also, I'm gonna be here for 11 hours because it's an unpaid hour of lunch in the middle of this 10 hour day. It was a shock. So eventually I get this piece of Sintra cut that's like four feet long and I take it to my desk table and it fills most of the desk when I lay it down. And I'm just sort of looking at it and I'm wondering like, okay, what's the front end of the spaceship supposed to look like? 
So I go upstairs and I ask Evan, hey, um, you know, what's the front end of the spaceship supposed to look like? <laughs> are, are there directions to, that I can follow to make this? You know, or, you know, blueprints or whatever I'm supposed to use to build this stuff, this front end piece? And he says, well, they want something like the front end of the Sulaco, the ship from Aliens. And I was like, okay, are there any drawings or plans, or sketches, instructions? <laughs> He's like, no, just go make a bunch of nernies and you can cast some pieces in resin to replicate them. And yeah, just just go build the front end. You know, like, just go do your job now. And I was flabbergasted. Like, I just did not understand what he was telling me, which was exactly what I thought he was telling me. I just couldn't believe it was really how this was supposed to work. Just go make stuff up and stick it on this faceplate thing I'd cut on the largest, most terrifying power tool I'd ever used. I went back downstairs to Hoffman and I was like, hey man, what is going on here? They want me to build something without telling me what the something is I'm supposed to build. And I don't remember exactly, but I'm pretty sure Hoffman was confused by my confusion. So I have to say one thing. I got through my first month in the industry for one reason. And that reason is my buddy Hoffman. Had I not had a friend there like him who actually knew what he was doing, I probably would have quit within the first week. I distinctly remember having a cigarette after lunch one day, sitting way out in the back, leaning against the chain link fence that bordered the empty concrete canal behind the shop, wearing my old military coveralls, covered in dust and lacquer primer and super glue, and just thinking how this whole endeavor felt like I was in like a work camp or something. I was like, who works 50 hour weeks minimum? Who does this stuff voluntarily? But I eventually got over it mostly, and I learned quite a bit. Not necessarily about building models. I mean, yeah, I learned a lot about fabrication, but I learned more about life and myself there. <laughs> Looking back, it definitely had the same sort of impact on me as having been in the army. There were general life lessons that I learned there. One of the biggest ones was the very idea that people just do stuff from scratch. Like you can be given an idea or have an idea and then just do it or make it without being told how to make it or exactly what to make. Now that sounds dumb, but it was kind of like the opposite of the military, you know, where we were always being told exactly what to do and when to do it. In the effect shop, there was a ton of just constant problem solving. Anyway, I used to tell people that a group of special effects guys would be the best at robbing banks if they decided to pull off a heist. Not only because of the vast array of skills and materials and weird research we'd have to do sometimes, but because of the constant problem solving that we did. You know, a client is like, hey, we want this on screen, and it has to do X, Y, Z. And then the client leaves, and we have to figure out how to do X, Y, Z. It was pretty cool, even though when you're in it, it's tough as hell and very hard work. Like most adventures. It's super cool to call it an adventure when you're not in the middle of it. Because when you're in the middle of it, it just sort of seems like a terrible life experience. <laughs> but yeah, that's how I got into the industry. And it's from that experience and the people I met there that I got into filmmaking itself eventually. So just like the army, it was a formative experience and not one I'd give up. It's definitely not the kind of work I would want to do today. I mean, it's not even the kind of work I really wanted to do back then, but at that time, it was the coolest thing I had going and it was the stepping stone to other things. And quite a few of you asked me about bringing more tips and tricks from the effects industry to apply to our tabletop gaming hobby. And while there will be some, it might surprise you to learn that a lot of the stuff we did would relate far more to construction projects and I mean like building houses, stuff like that, than it does to, you know, our hobby sized models. But the main tip I would say is just reiterating what I mentioned earlier. If you have an idea, you can just make it or do it, even if you don't know how. Whatever the idea is, it just means you have to do some problem solving to achieve it. Even if there ain't no blueprint, especially if there ain't no blueprint. I mean, you gotta make the brand new blueprint. <laughs> See ya.